I think bands used to work harder. This is Roger Rocha. All I knew was rehearsing five days a week. You know, from age 16 to 38 years old or something, you know? Uh, I'm 46. Roger is a guitarist, and he leads a band called the Golden Hearts, based in San Francisco. You'll hear some of their music on the show today. When Roger was younger, he was in a band called Four Non Blondes, whose hit What's Up was pretty much inescapable in 1993. And when I met the foreign bonds, they were rehearsing five days a week from noon to five. That's what bands did. And when I was at the rehearsal secret studios or whatever in later bands, we were, you know, three, four days a week. And all the other bands we see them, they were all playing. And I asked bands, you know, after we rehearse them, you know, before we have a gig, I'm like, what the fuck? Are you kidding me? You are listening to Running the Voodoo Down on BAM. Welcome back to Running the Voodoo Down. I'm Micah Dubroy. It's one thing to try to make a life as a musician, which, perhaps contrary to popular imagination, requires a huge work ethic. It's quite another to try to make it as a band, which requires an even more insane amount of work, an ability to run a business, and the perseverance to do things like rehearse five days a week instead of having a day job, because that's the only way your project is going to work, even if you have no assurances it will do any such thing. Why does a human being make a choice to invest themselves like that? Seriously. And how much does that investment continue to demand down the road? I met Roger through his presence in the music scene in San Francisco, and I asked him to come on the show because the arc of Four Non Blondes was so sudden and so clear. Yeah, I feel like I've walked on the moon for a minute. And because of his sincere dedication to the importance of being in a band. Let's back up for a moment. Four Non Blondes was a four-piece rock group from San Francisco, none of whom were blonde, fronted by singer Linda Perry. Their huge hit, What's Up, eventually put them on tour around the world. And if you listen to popular music, you'll probably recognize this song. Roger joined the band as they were finishing their debut album, Bigger, Better, Faster, More, in 1992. I was looking for the inside story of the band, but I wanted to start at the beginning. So I asked him what he had been doing before he met Four Non Blondes, if he had been in other bands, or if he had worked as a studio guitarist. I've had people tell me, hey, Roger, you should be a studio musician. And I say, no, man, this sounds miserable to me, because I don't want to... I've never wanted to play in a hundred different bands and learn every style to where I feel like I don't even know who I am anymore. It sounds confusing. And it sounds like I'd have to lug around racks of gear because someone's going to go, hey, man, I need like a, can you do the Jimmy Page thing? You know, don't you have a Les Paul with you and wanting me to be this and be that and have rack gear and I mean stage, I guess you can have, bring, probably bring your iPhone and get any sound <laughs> you want, you know? Give me a minute to upload this new app and I'll get that sound you want. But I I just always wanted to be in like what I call like a real band where very specific characters that create a chemistry so you have a thing. A thing you can't get on your own, but with this other person, they're like pushing stuff out of you and bringing stuff out of you. That's always what I've been interested in. And is that what Porn on Blondes was like? Very much so, yeah. Before that, I played in uh, four different bands, which is really the same band, just different versions of different singers, with my brother on drums. It's a rock band. My brother and I played together from about 15 years old. He's five years younger. I was about 18. And we just, it was like the Van Halen Brothers or something, you know, or Hunt Tony Sales. We just like were a team. We practiced five days a week after school or after work for years. And We moved to Los Angeles to just see if we could, you know, make a career out of it or something. And he got killed while I was living down there in 1991. So long story short, I got strung out in drugs and to clean up, I came back to San Francisco. And when I got here, my friend Brian, 
was working at a copy mill with me. He told me about this band Four Non Blondes, how amazing they were, and, but they needed a guitar player, and they'd gotten signed. So he got me so excited that I, I pushed to track him down, and I got an audition. And when I heard Linda sing, I was like, my head exploded. I said, I have to be in this band with these women. And I just felt like I willed myself into the band, you know. Like, I'm, I'm the guy, you know. I remember cornering Linda at the first rehearsal, just getting a drink of water. And I said, look, I, you write all these beautiful songs, but I don't think you guys have the, the rock and roll element that you guys seem to like want and I have that you and me it'd be great together and she just looked at me weird and then next day they offered me the cake so I tell myself my story the pictures of places that I've never seen I thought about this match of glory There's somebody listening talking to me Did they check you out at all? Did you know? Did you have any like demos to give them, or was it no, just this the, is they like, vibed? It's, it's like what I said earlier about a real band. I mean, and when I say real band, I don't want to put down any projects I've done where you know it's good musicians playing together. But there's something about certain combinations of people that if you're lucky to find a weird thing happens where it feels like there's somebody else in the room, like another spirit. And it's in this case, and I've seen this in other bands I've toured with. The, there was Don on drums, Chris Don on bass, Linda singing, writing songs, and me on guitar, and also writing songs. Don like kept her mouth shut. She's like the mom, um, keeping the peace and just never making a mistake. Krista playing the crap out of her bass, very competitive and very quick-witted. And Linda has such a strong personality, will steamroll over anybody. Um, because she knows what she wants and she knows how to get it. But then Krista could, was so quick, they, like she met her match wit-wise. So that would throw Linda a little off balance, which is good for a band. Otherwise, it would just be a Linda Perry show, which is what she has now, a solo career. But for the good of the band, we have the, you have these really specific characters like it's like chemistry, like molecules. You know, you put these molecules together, you get one thing. You put these other molecules together, you get the other thing. And then I was very easygoing, and they're all women, and very intense, you know. And I love to play to this day with women and not just guys, because the male energy can get a little much, a little too macho. And I, I like to play with women because it balances the energy. It was also a good combination. Me and Leonard were more like the instinctual animal musicians you know I didn't know anything about music at the time I just taught myself completely self-taught and I could play but I didn't know the names of the notes or the chords or anything I figured out all my own scales and all that stuff and then Lynn and Krista were super anal just everything had to be perfect they played the same notes the same parts every night which drove me crazy because that's not music to me that's you're not creating you're like recreating however if you put some Two people like me and Linda against that, it creates a loose, tight band, you know? Very tight, but also there's a fight to be spontaneous. It's that complicated interpersonal dynamic that creates what Roger was talking about when he said it feels like there's another spirit in the room. From my experience, it's that feeling that's the most addictive part of being in a band. Roger joined the group, as I mentioned, as they neared completion of their first record. I asked him what happened next. The album was done, but it, it was there were some issues with it. You know, like the, the song What's Up had yeah. been recorded, and the producer had put like a marching drums on it, and you know, he wanted to put his stamp on it. And... I th you know that song Free Fallin' by Tom Petty? Yeah. It's like a marching yeah, drum yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Maybe he had heard that and think, you know, let's do <laughs> okay. the, that Free Fallin' thing. And so um, so Linda Perry, who's now um, a successful producer, took her own money and 
said, I want to go produce this song, What's Up? And I think she went to Fantasy and recorded it, you know, and directed it. And um, so there was some funny stuff when I joined the band and we went and record, re-recorded some stuff. Okay. But that's the hit you hear on the radio. And it's Linda's first hit song, production job, actually. She, so she produced that song. Okay. I didn't know that. David Tickle produced the rest of them. And there's all kinds of weird guitars on that record. I mean, I think Shauna's original guitar player is playing some stuff. It's a guy named Lewis playing some guitar stuff. And then I joined. Okay. And then after I joined, the, some issues are fixed with the record. And the record came out. And Interscope put us on the road in a van playing clubs. Okay. Well, Head, how big headlining clubs? Headlining clubs. You know, but no one knew who we were. <laughs> so we're doing a headlining wow. tour, but, uh, you know, rooms that fit like 200 people, just small clubs. Or like the bottom of the hill. We played, um, what is it, Raji's in LA? The Casbah in San Diego. Oh, yeah. Places like place. that, okay? And no, no one would show up. So we did that for almost a year. Okay. And nobody would play the single. You know, radio stations wouldn't play it because this was the, the beginning of the grunge era. Oh, yeah. Nirvana was king. Pearl Jam was blowing up and they were already pretty big. And L7, you remember them? It's an all-female grunge band, basically. I they don't was, know if I knew them, but yeah. They were all-female band, but they sounded really heavy. Okay. And so people would see the women in the band, see me with long hair, probably think I was a girl in the picture, and play, hear all the acoustic guitars and think this isn't grunge, you know? Right. But it's also kind of folky. It didn't fit any format, so nobody wanted to play it. So we became a tight band, you know, and learned a lot about each other's personalities traveling around on the road for a year with them um, in a van. And then one guy, a DJ in Las Vegas, played the song because he liked it and his phones blew up. Huh. Like in those old movies about Buddy Holly or something where the phones are going crazy, you know, and the full board's lighting up. And he would was ended up playing that song like seven times a day. Wow. Like people were requesting it. At that point, we had got an opening slot for a band called Dada who had a hit called I'm Going to Disneyland. So we're opening a couple of shows for them and we get to Las Vegas and we drive up, and it was like the Beatles. For, for us, it was like being in the Beatles, you know, because we look, and there's this huge line around the block. Like, wow, that is really popular in Vegas. And we walk out, and people are looking at us, and, you know, who are you guys? You know, we're non blondes. And then people are screaming, and we're like, what the fuck's going on? And it turns out all these people were there to see us. Wow. And so when we open, people are going crazy. So we're going from playing empty clubs for almost a year to this one show in Vegas where we're like, people are screaming and going crazy. And I see a girl I recognize in the front row from San Francisco who's living in Vegas and she's like all excited. I'm like, what the, is this happening? You know, <laughs> is this band taking off? Um, so that was pretty cool. And then from, it just kind of spread from there. Other DJs in the area started adding it. And it just spread very organically, actually. Wow. And I credit this one DJ, I wish he knew his name, for just playing the song. Because there was all kinds of record company reps whining and dining these people trying to get them to play it. And no one would play it. But once people started playing it, uh, it just took off. And then later we did a video for MTV and that just made it even bigger. What can I do to get it started? Now the giant. The song peaked at number 14 on the U.S. Billboard charts. In Europe, though, the song was number one, continuing a trend of the rest of the world valuing American music, perhaps higher than at home. When it was on MTV, and I think it was 92, 
we couldn't get it everywhere fast enough. You know, it was blowing up in Brazil and South America. We were interviewed by people from Japan. You know, it was they were playing it in Greece. Uh, so we toured for two months with Aerosmith in the United States. And then after that, at some point, um, and we had gone back and forth to, to Europe to do Top of the Pops. I think we did it six or seven times, which is a very famous show yeah. in, in England. And, I mean, the Stones had played it, and the Beatles have played it. It's one of those shows that's been going on and on forever. Like, I don't know what it's like here, what it's like. Ameri- like American Bandstand was. Yeah. And that show's gone, right? I mean, Dick I Clark's yeah. done. So that was very exciting. And so we'd done that a number of times, and then we did a headlining tour in Europe. It was completely sold out. And what did it feel like? I mean, did it feel kind of surreal the whole time, or did did you kind of get used to the feeling? Or it was stressful, man. It was stressful. I was awkward twenty five year old, you know, who had um, been strung out on drugs a year before in L A. after my brother died. So I was kind of a mess. But at the same time, I was super focused. You know, I was pissed off that my brother died. And I used to tell him, we're going to get signed by the time I'm 25 years old, and we're going to open for Aerosmith. Like, I just had this crazy thing. And I was 25 when I was in this band. We were signed, and I was touring, and we got this tour open for Aerosmith. It was kind of weird. And it's one of those things where just things kept lining up, and then, you know, my prophecy came true or something. So it was a little surreal, but it was very stressful. Touring is, is hard when you're on the road for, you know, a year. We ended up playing, we are on the road for two years when it was all said and done. Straight. With a couple breaks, we come home for a week or two. Wow. So, I mean, what's the longest you've ever been on the road? Five, six weeks. In that short of a span, at mm-hmm. first it's crazy, and then you get used to it. Mm-hmm. And then you kind of can't imagine doing anything else. But I assume there's a couple of steps after that. Well, okay. There is this, I call them levels. There's certain levels where like things reset and you're starting over. It's like, it's like anything, you know, it's like you get your white belt and then you get your blue belt or whatever. It's like anything where you think, I got this nailed down. And then you move up the ladder and like you're at the bottom again. And so that happens. And also, I'm sure it's different for everybody. Some people like can manage it some people are just you know alcoholics on the road and they just they burn themselves out you know and i filmed that trap a couple times to the point where we did sober tours oh wow which was great it was actually it was it felt like it was hard you know but when we i came home people go man you look great you know i i that didn't come home looking like train wreck yeah so were the non-sober tours were you generally clean by that point, or were you still kind of struggling with some of that stuff from your before? No, 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 I was clean. I did. I quit. Um, what cold turkey? You wow. know that I don't know how I did it, but um, I just did. And so I, when I was in LA, I was doing heroin. I was uh, smoking it. I was snorting it, and I was doing a lot of speed. I was doing coke. I was doing some acid, mushrooms. Um, drinking anything I get my hands on it was wild you know and at the same time I was like recording music and hung out with Axel Rose a friend of mine knew from Indiana was, you know the drug dealer's house and rock stars sons would come over and score it was nuts it was like I don't regret it because I mean I wasn't by myself at home getting wasted I was getting wasted with being around a lot of cool stuff but I almost killed myself so and then when you actually became a rock star that kind of stuff stopped to a certain extent rock star is a strong term you know? <laughs> jimmy page is a rock star you know i feel like i had a rock star experience you know so we're playing these clubs you know we're drinking beer and just doing what you do and hanging out play a show and once after vegas when we had this you know incredible response as they played a song on the radio we got a gig opening for Big Head Todd and the Monsters. And they still play. They're, they're kind of like a band that um, has kind of a, like a blues travelers type following. You know, kind of early 
pre-jam band scene type band. Very bluesy, great songs, great guitar player, but they're not really on the radio that much, but they have very loyal fans that come out and see them live. And they're from Chicago, so we would open for them, and we did that for a couple months, and by the end of the tour, half the audience was coming to see us. And it felt like very competitive between us and them, like who's gonna like kill, kill tonight, you know? And it was friendly competition, they were great. But there were nights when we would go out and just blaze, and the crowd would be going crazy. We're like, I think we stole the show. But then Todd would come out and play the shit out of his guitar, breaking strings. He'd put Voodoo Child in the set. They'd be doing shots, and we're like, oh man, he fucking destroyed us, you know? But it was like a healthy competition. But but we were no longer uh, just just the opening band. Yeah. But to me, that was the sweet spot of my touring experience right at that level where you're the opener but you're getting a great response people are coming to see you and after you're set you can go out and enjoy a show you know you can have a drink you can mingle and talk to people and enjoy this great band that you're touring with and then after their show go out and hang out that was a sweet spot uh what happened next is we moved up to the next level level where we started opening for Aerosmith. And that was rough, man, because we're so excited we're going to go and tour with Aerosmith, but we're playing these big, huge places. And we have a half an hour set. So it gives you, we're just warming up after 15 minutes. Um, and we're playing in the daytime to an empty outdoor shoreline amphitheater type place and during our set people are eating hot dogs and walking around and not even they're just they're there for aerosmith and it's a little depressing to this day when i see a band on a huge giant stage it's like a skill to play on stage that far away when you're a hundred feet away from your bass player or 70 feet like literally it's crazy it's nothing like what you and I enjoy doing down at, you know, I don't know, the Boom Room or something. Yeah. At this point, are you still touring in the van? When we, the Aerosmith time, we were in a bus. Okay. Um, the Big Head Todd time. So we played empty clubs in a van, you know, with some discount roadies. And then when we got to, uh, we started getting some airplay. Uh, we were still in a van opening for Big Head Todd but playing like uh, Warfield sized places they were selling out you know we played like First Avenue in Minneapolis which was exciting because that's where they filmed Purple Rain you know say, yeah. like that's like film more and bigger you know places more like the Warfield mostly but we're still in a van and then when we got an MTV we moved into a tour bus and those things are very expensive you know a lot of money. I forget. I used to be able to quote the number, but it was something, something crazy, like you know, five thousand a week or something. Wow. And I don't remember that, but it was something like what? But it made life much more comfortable. You know, sleeping in advance great, but sleeping in a bunk in a tour bus is is fantastic. Yeah. You know, the the movement would put me to sleep. We'd get to the hotel at four in the morning, and sometimes I'd stay in the bunk. That wasn't the only one. Like, who wouldn't go into the room? Because, like, sometimes you just getting up and getting into the room, then you can't go to sleep, and it's four in the morning, you toss and turn. And then after the Aerosmith tour, we went to Europe, did a headlining tour, and we had two buses. One bus was all crew, and we had a stage built with ramps, we had our own lights. It was crazy, because we were the number one band out there. You know, and we were number one on these charts for months. And every show was sold out in advance. It was pandemonium. It was crazy. So yeah, that was a big production. There were all this European, this pirate crew of European roadies. They didn't know all their names, you know, but um, it was just a big thing. It was a fast moving train. We do press conferences and interviews all day and get to the show and, you know, get on the bus and do more interviews and do the show. There was no time to do anything. Man. I would meet girls after the show. And then 
Bus is leaving, Raj. Damn it. You know? <laughs> it can be a glorious lifestyle, but it's not forgiving. At that point, we were getting tired. We were getting burnt out. We were trying to write songs. You know, Lennon and I were always up in the hotel room, hashing out stuff. She was always writing songs. I was always coming up with ideas. But it, we weren't grounded. You know, we were getting burnt out to the point in 1993, in the middle of our tour, Lindy just went home. Oh, wow. She said, I've had enough. And we had shows booked in Greece and Rome. And it's a lifelong dream of mine to go to Greece and Rome. Because uh, I was interested in archaeology when I was a kid. But uh, I was sad we didn't get to do that. But she went home. Where, where were you? I think it, it was, the last show was in Germany. I might be wrong, but I remember it being Hamburg, Hamburg, Germany. So what happened when she when she left? That was it. That was it. That just, was the end of our live touring. Did you guys just we go never home played or live again? Really? She she took off with some girl and just disappeared for a week, and then she flew back to San Francisco and told the record company, "I'm done touring." And it was grueling. We were telling them we were burnt out. And we were telling the record company we need a vacation, and so they'd fly us home for two weeks. But the two weeks would turn into one week, which would turn into three days. They go, well, yep, we committed you to this festival. It's very important. You have to do it, or you're on David Letterman tomorrow night, which is great. I have no problem with that. Fine, you know, let's go. But we just really never got to take a proper vacation. You know, there was no two months off or anything just to recharge. So it was grueling. Wow. Did you feel like you had any control as a band over what you were doing, or was it all just kind of... I only know that my experience with this band sounds a little different than some other bands' experience. We used to rehearse five days a week, from noon to five, Monday through Friday, before we hit the road for the first time. And nobody ever came to a rehearsal, except for this one time, some guy from Famous Music Publishing... He's going to come down and hear the new songs you're writing or whatever. So some guy, nerdy guy in a suit, and glasses comes in and sat there for a rehearsal, and then he left. And that was it. Other than that, manager was never there. No one was ever saying, you know, pointing us in a direction. We go to photo shoots. Sometimes it'd be a stylist with racks of clothes, and it's like, sorry, we just wear what we wear. There was no musical direction. We didn't have control over our schedule, but we had control over how we looked, how we presented ourselves, the photographs, the music, all that. If you've ever watched any behind the music specials or read about musicians working with the major labels, you know this isn't always the case. Linda and I were sitting in the editing room of the videos all the time. For, for every video, we did five videos. Uh, f- five videos for four songs. One song, Spaceman, was two different shoots cut together. Roger emphasized how important it was to be hands-on. You know, because it's your art. And anything, the the video, the artwork is an extension of your art. And to have somebody else's vision put on top of that, it's it's not them. You know how the Beatles have the stereo version and the mono version, and they were releasing a lot of stuff from the 60s in the mono version? Well, back in the 60s, only rich people had stereos. Or, you know, some... It was brand new. Everybody had, most people had mono. And the Paul McCartney and John Lennon were in the room for the mono mixes. And then they would bail. And the engineers would make the stereo mix. You know, and this happened a lot. Stereo mixes were, were incidental. But we're, we've been all listening to stereo mixes. And when I heard the mono Beatles mixes, it had like a really, a clarity, a focus to it. And some of the Beatles stuff in stereo used to sound like, oh, it's so trippy, you know? And when I heard the mono mixes, it sounded so logical. And I go, oh, man, what I'm hearing the brain of the engineer and not the pure sound of the Beatles when I'm hearing the stereo mixes. This, some of this panning stuff is not from the Beatles and it's confusing the music. And maybe, you know, these mono mixes sound so clear and logical. That's. To me, that's the Beatles. When I should, you know, I just had an epiphany when I was listening to them in mono. 
And so I think it's very important for the artist to like stay in control. And yeah. You know, there's a time you can't be Mr. Nice Guy. You have it's your fucking art. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so when we made these these videos, me and Linda would re-edit every single one of them. And to this day, I've I've noticed that uh, filmmakers, you know, friends who make film, will shoot videos for friends of mine, and I don't understand why they don't cut on the beat. You know, like seriously, yeah. I mean, I've seen this over and over from all kinds of different people. I'm sure some would do, do. And actually, I'd like to watch some of my favorite movies and see. Maybe they don't cut on the beat and it's fine. You know the show Breaking Bad? Yeah. That's yeah. the only show I know they were cutting on the beat. You know, there would be some like musical cues and they would cut on the beat. I'm like, there it is. That That's why this show's great. That little detail right there. Whether or not you're in creative control, going on a major tour can be really disorienting. Oh yeah, there's a couple years missing where people mention shows. I don't even know, know what shows because I don't know them. Let's say Kids in the Hall or something like that. Some show that that was on and they'll be talking about it. You never saw that show? I'm like, I don't know. when It was on in like 92, 93. I'm like, oh man, you know, I, I missed everything because I was on tour. You know, there were if there were current bands, I might have heard about them, but I wasn't going to other people's shows much. I would see the shows of the bands I was on tour with. Public moments, private moments. Just uh, news events, you know, birthdays, <laughs> just holidays. I'm, I, It's like missing years because the schedule, let's see if I could break this down really quick. Okay, wake up at nine in the morning for a 10 o'clock, uh, press conference to 11 o'clock. Then the band breaks up into groups to do interviews for various magazines from 11 to 1. And then maybe you go back to your room and do some phone interviews till maybe 2 o'clock. And at 2 o'clock, I start, you know, maybe take a nap. 3 o'clock, I gotta, you know, I'm just, maybe I have a guitar in my room or change my strings, decide what kind of clothes I'm gonna bring to the gig. Maybe 4.30, car rolls around, then I get in to go to sound check. I want to be at sound check early. I got some new pedal I'm going to try out, a new wah pedal. I try it out. End sound check, maybe 7 o'clock. Maybe drive back or not to the hotel. Play the show at 8.30. Done at 9.30. Hang out backstage at 10 o'clock. Get on the bus. Midnight. And then at 4 in the morning... Maybe we pull up to the hotel and then either stay in the bunk or go to the hotel room and then sack of the pizza over. You know, so, so, something like, and so there's no time to really watch TV or go do stuff. And even after the show, like I was saying before, the bus is leaving town. So the sweet spot of touring is when you don't have the pressure of a lot of big success, but you're on your way and you're an opening band at like the Warfield. And after the show, you can enjoy the show, and the bus is not rushing off to this next gig because you're playing five, six, seven gigs a week. You know, you kind of enjoy your your success. Four Non Blondes wound down not too long after their European tour ended. Linda Perry left to pursue a solo career, and everyone else began working on their own projects, which they continued to pursue. Roger's current band, as I mentioned, is the Golden Hearts. Four Non Blondes didn't play together again until recently. We just reunited after 20 years at an event called An Evening with Women in Los Angeles. And we just walked in the room to rehearse and we just played the songs without discussion. And it sounded like we were rusty maybe from not having played for a month. It, it came together though after how long did it take to shake, shake that rust off? Uh, a couple songs. Man. After 20 years. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, we didn't discuss anything, and you could tell uh, Linda hadn't, you know, listened to anything, even to brush up. And I watched some videos on YouTube, you know, and I don't think anybody practiced for it, you know. We just showed up and, and did it. What's it like watching videos of your band from 20 years ago on YouTube today? Um, I see, you know, lots of money. I mean, because... Yeah. You know, it's so expensive to make those videos. You know, I'm trying to make a video now. And just the luxury to just have the record company, you know, say, we want you to make a video. You know, and they spend all kinds of money making it. And there's, 
cameras on those little railroad tracks and a director and you get to pick from five directors. Red Company doesn't like the video. Make another one. Make another one. Then, you know, you cut those two together. The luxury of just having that, um, what do you call it, budget. I mean, that's what I was thinking about actually when I was watching the videos. And I look a lot skinnier. It's <laughs> like 115 pounds back then. How, how old were you at the time? Um, I was 25 years old. Oh, wow. If you're, do you want, would you, you do it again? With the Golden Heart? Yeah, would you want to do something like that? Would I want to? If it had that kind of budget behind it, I would do it. Yeah, I would do it. But you have to have a whole group of people who are willing to sacrifice that part of their life. I mean, yeah. when you're on tour for, for that long, I couldn't have a girlfriend. Yeah. I, mean, I made a conscious decision. Like, I cannot get sucked into any relationship. You know, I have to, even if it's a perfect woman for me or anything, I just have to block that out of my mind. That's not happening right now. This is my time to work my ass off to make this happen. It's my chance. I don't want to fuck it up. And that's why I did a couple sober tours. I can feel myself slipping into unhealthiness. I recommend yoga for anybody who's going to do a lot of touring. Seriously. I bought a yoga book and it saved my ass doing that yoga every day. Like, really helped me, man. And drink lots of water. <laughs> and put your name on the bottle. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Thank you so much, Roger. Okay, Micah. And that wraps up the episode. I want to thank Roger Rocha for speaking with me so candidly about his career. The music today has been provided by Four Non Blondes, The Golden Hearts, Andrew Lawbacker, Quinn DeVoe and the Blue Beat Review, Kelly McFarlane, Benjamin Andrews. You can check in the credits of this episode or at our blog, which can be found at rtvd.bamm.tv for info on all the bands and links to their music. Please send us any thoughts you might have on the program, pieces you like, desires for topics or guests, curses, complaints, whatever floats your boat. You can comment directly at the blog, on SoundCloud or iTunes, however it is you're listening to this. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe on iTunes so you can receive all the new episodes directly. We also have a Twitter account. Follow at RunTheVoodoo for all our up-to-the-moment musical discoveries, insights, and poor attempts at jokes. I'm Micah Dubroy, and this has been Running the Voodoo Down on BAM-FM. <laughs>